Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar of the series dedicated to the joint call high performance computing. My name is Ramona Kaula, and I am coordinator of the National Competence Center in High Performance Computing, hosted at Lux Innovation. It is the national contact point uh, for high performance computing and uh, high performance data analytics and artificial intelligence. Today, uh, here with me, there is uh, my colleague Maximilian Prisville, advisor uh, for corporate R&D and innovation support at Lux Innovation, who will have a short presentation for you about the main eligibility criteria and eligible project costs for the joint call HPC. And we also have Dr. Christian Pouli, project manager at the Luxembourg Ministry of the Economy, and Dr. Uh, Saktivel Sundaram, uh, program innovation manager um, at the Luxembourg National Research Fund. Uh, they remain available throughout the whole session to answer any questions you may have uh, regarding the call text or call process or the criteria uh, of this joint call. Um, so, as you may remember, two weeks ago, uh, the joint call HPC was launched by the Ministry of the Economy, the National Research Fund, and Lux Innovation on the 15th of September. Um, the same day, we also organized the first info webinar. Um, and uh, um, as a short reminder as well, um, the HPC call for project targets private stakeholders with substantial expertise in the field of computer-aided R&D, uh, big data analytics, or training of artificial intelligence algorithms, but little or no expertise in the use of uh, an HPC infrastructure. Uh, hence, the opportunity for these companies to rely on strong support and collaboration for public research institutes to realize the successful transition of their workloads from a workstation to an HPC infrastructure, uh, with the aim to realize uh, complex simulations with multiple parameters or virtual testing optimization of new products, design, processes, or complex materials. Uh, also big data analytics and visualizations of a huge amount of data points, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, or prediction and forecasting of complex models. These methodologies can be applied to areas such as manufacturing, advanced engineering, materials, energy, and environmental technologies and communications. Um, I hope all of you had the opportunity to check out the call of the text on the research industry collaboration platform and um, as I recall the joint call for HPC has been structured in two phases so the first phase will be on the project idea with deadline on 15 of November and then we'll go on with the second phase for a full project proposal between the beginning of January and of February next year. In order to assure that you are fully aware of the evaluation criteria for this first phase, we have decided to set up this Q&A sessions uh, where we will present more specific uh, criteria of this phase one. Uh, and we are happy uh, to be there today uh, for the second session about this main eligibility criteria and eligible project costs for the joint call. And we'll focus on your Q, uh, on your questions, and we'll have a Q and A session at the end um, after this short presentation. With this in mind, don't hesitate to use the Q and A tab on the right side of your screen to type your questions. Uh, we will address them after the short presentation, um, and you can also use the chat box uh, if you have any technical problems uh, with sound or visualization of this webinar. I also invite you to introduce yourself and use this platform for networking. Uh, just one last point. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and made available on the Research Industry Collaboration platform uh, after uh, the session is ending. Uh, with this, I would like to hand over to Max uh, for his short presentation and then to uh, slide into your Q&A, uh, in the Q&A session to answer your questions. Max, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ramona, for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Welcome to this first Q&A session on the main eligibility criteria 
and the eligible project costs for the joint call HBC. Um, so while today's presentation is focusing mostly on the companies that would like to participate in the call, the session is of course also open to all the interested research organizations. And as Ramona already mentioned at the end of this webinar, you will all have the possibility to ask your questions and together with our colleagues here present today, we will be more than happy to answer them. As mentioned, if you already have some questions that you would like to share with us, please feel free to do so within the questions tab. So here, just a short reminder of the involved parties in this joint call HPC. So as, already, as, ha as has already been mentioned, those are especially the Ministry of the Economy, the National Research Fund FNR and Lux Innovation. So this slide should give you an overview of the main eligibility criteria for the applicant companies. The dotted box actually, actually shows you the usual eligibility criteria as they are defined in the national RDI law of the 17th of May 2017 and which will be the main funding instrument for the interested companies in the HBC call. So some of you might already be familiar with these criteria thanks to your previous RDI applications. So in a nutshell, we have essentially the company's co-funding capacity, the economic impact of the project, the innovation itself, meaning that there should be a new or improved product, process or service, which offers the company a competitive advantage on the market, and for which the company needs to overcome also some technological challenges. And last but not least, there are also some additional generic criteria for the company. In addition to these main criteria that we will discuss in more detail on the following slides, there are also some very specific criteria for this HPC call. So first of all, there's the obligation to have a collaboration of at least one national company with at least one national public research organization. And second, your projects should be considered as industrial research projects in order to address new research questions and to create a sustainable knowledge gain for both the companies and the research organizations. So as mentioned, I would, I would now like to go into more detail on these criteria on the following slides. Here we have, first of all, the uh, applicant company who needs to demonstrate its financial viability and soundness regarding its contribution to the R&D project. Based on the maximum aid rates that you can see at the bottom of this slide, a company would need to be able to provide the remaining financial resources to cover its total eligible project budget. This co-financing capacity is actually one of the main criteria. And therefore, we would really invite you to carefully document within the aid application um, that you are able to co-fund your project. How should you do that? Well, the, um, the attachments that you will see on the PPP platform will ask you to provide a cash flow forecast on the one hand, but in addition, also your annual or your latest annual accounts. While this co-funding capacity should be mainly made up of equity, you can also use uh, loans or future free cash flows as a complement um, for your co-funding capacity. Overall, it is here really important that you provide a realistic budget estimation and that you clearly document the, avail the available financial means of the company. But because this criterion is so important, we will even dedicate our next Q&A session on the 13th of October to this very specific topic. Another important criterion is the economic impact of the project. Here, the company needs to really illustrate its economic substance in Luxembourg and the positive impact of the expected project outcome. Therefore, um, the company would need to demonstrate within the aid application that it has an economic substance in Luxembourg or that it has a plan to create this substance during the course of the project. Um, please also remind, 
I'll be reminded that um, this substance should be mostly generated by the internal employees of the company. And in addition to demonstrate this economic impact of the project, the company should also derive an economic benefit from the project itself and should detail the expected exploitation of the project results within the aid application. As I mentioned, there are also some more generic criteria that the company needs to respect. The first one here being the so-called incentive effect criterion, which means that the aid should have a positive effect on the realization of your project. To respect this criterion, the consortium would need to evade the final funding decision before they can actually start the project. So as has been uh, said in the, in the information session two weeks ago, we expect the project to start around July of next year. But this means also that the company is not allowed to engage into any contracts or legally binding agreements on this very specific project scope before having received the final funding decision from the Ministry of the Economy and for its partner, for its public partner from the National Research Fund. Last but not least, um, there's of course also no retroactivity of the already engaged costs in order to respect the incentive effect. Another very important generic criterion concerns the SME analysis, which will be used to define the size of the undertaking and the group that it might be part of. Here, we really need to consider not only the applicant company itself, but also all the other companies that would need to be considered as linked or partner to the applicant. So linked companies are those that have a direct or indirect control of the majority of voting rights in another, in another company, and thus also the ability to exercise a dominant influence on that company. To give you an example, if my company holds 80% of another company, those two would be considered as linked. For the partner companies, those are that that have a capital of voting right equal to or greater than 25% and would thus not be considered as linked. To also give you an example of a partner company, this would be the case if one company holds, for instance, 40% of another one. Because this SME analysis is really important, not only to define the size of the company, but also the applicable aid rates, you will be asked already at phase one to provide a uh, detailed organizational chart of your company and the group that it might be part of. So it's really important that this chart is complete and that it also reflects all the partner and link companies up to the ultimate beneficial owner. And um, how to assess the size of the group? Well, as I said, it's not only about the applicant company itself, but we would in addition also need to add 100% of the FTEs, turnover and balance sheet of all the linked companies, as well as a pro rata of all the partner companies. As um, Christian already explained briefly during the information session two weeks ago, there's also the criterion of the undertaking not being in difficulty, which is really important in regards to the eligibility to the state aids, because companies that would be considered in difficulty would not be eligible to state aids in general, unless they can clearly document that they are already in the process of resolving this, this issue, for example, by means of a recapitalization of the company. In general, an undertaking is considered to be in difficulty if it has lost more than half of um, if it has lost more than half of its share capital, including share premium, through accumulated losses. However, this would not apply to SMEs that are younger than three years. And um, for the large companies we would even need to go one step further and check two additional ratios based on your last two annual accounts. So first of all, the book debt to equity ratio would here need to be smaller than 7.5 and the EBITDA to interest cover coverage ratio would need to be greater than one in order to be eligible as a large company. 
this uh, financial criterion of the undertaking difficulty needs to be assessed both at the level of the applicant company and at the group level. Therefore, at the end of phase one, you will be um, requested to submit two documents. On the one hand, the 2021 annual accounts of the applicant company, and in addition, also the 2021 consolidated accounts of the group. If your group does not have any consolidated accounts, this um, can also be done through a simplified aggregation of the applicant and all the linked companies. But if you need any support on this aggregation, Lux Innovation can here also provide you a template. Um, so here you can see also an example of such an undertaking in difficulty. As you can see, the company has lost more than 50% of its subscribed share capital and share premium due to its accumulated losses. While this is of course a rather extreme case where the company even has negative earned funds, a company could also be slightly in difficulty. So as you can see here, for instance, this company has positive earned funds of 5.7 million, but it would nevertheless be considered as in difficulty, given that it has lost more than 50% of its subscribed capital over the last years. In these two cases, the companies would need to demonstrate that they are already in the process of resolving this issue, as I mentioned before, for instance, through a recapitalization, in order to demonstrate that uh, this situation will be resolved during the course of the application process. Now, um, if you would like to get a short summary of these main eligibility criteria that I showed you so far, you can, of course, also have a look at the video tutorial that we prepared um, for, for the main eligibility criteria. And in addition, as Ramona already mentioned in the introduction of the webinar, you can, of course, also find the replay and the presentation slides directly on the uh, research industry collaboration platform. With that said, I would now like to give the floor to Dr. Saktival Suntaram from the FNR to also give you a short overview of the eligibility criteria and financial information for the research organizations. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Ramona. Uh, so uh, all the public institutions in Luxembourg generally are eligible. Um, so I think uh, we covered this particular slide already. I just want to address if uh, if the audience are from public research institutions. So I'm happy to help uh, after the presentation is over. See the uh, so the researcher, the PI, must have um, the work working contract that is covering the full coverage of the project. Uh, this means uh, last time there was a question about. Um, how many proposals a PI can submit. Uh, maybe uh, since it's a pilot call, uh, we did not uh, mention last time uh, as many as possible, but uh, I would like to address this point here. Uh, if you look at the Bridges guidelines, uh, it says one proposal per PI. Uh, so, uh, but in case if you have two ideas from public research, uh, research institutions, and then we can discuss case by case because we already said last time we can accept if you have many ideas but i see uh, the number of ideas are not that many at least from the public research institutions so far uh, who are inquired to us so we don't uh, go back but uh, if you have many ideas uh, we can discuss but uh, i see uh, based on the bridges guidelines uh, one PI can submit one uh, idea. Also, we encourage uh, you concentrate on that particular idea rather than spending more time for many, many proposals. And coming back again uh, to the resubmission, if you are uh, uh, if you are planning for the resubmission, the Bridges guideline says uh, one resubmission possible uh, next year in case uh, this call is going to continue. And coming to the aid rates, uh, this is 100% up to maximum 400,000 euros. Uh, and the project can start, uh, can have uh, from 24 months up to 36 months. And uh, all the financial guidelines are available on our website. Uh, it's, it's the same as the bridges, uh, nothing new is into this call. 
And if you have any specific questions on any particular budget item, I'm happy to help. So you can contact me later. And if you want to ad address, if you want to understand, um, because it's a special call uh, in the past, uh, what happens is uh, when we are, when we talk about this HPC cost, uh, so they, there was a little limitation, but since this is a special call, we are also uh, open to understand your need. Uh, so uh, we can also help you to uh, get the infrastructure which is necessary uh, for this particular uh, uh, joint call. And apart from that, uh, uh, all the institutions uh, which are uh, registered as a research institution in Luxembourg under the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Education and uh, uh, Higher Education and Research. And uh, so far, the inquiries have come from uh, the leading institutions. But I also uh, received uh, some of the uh, pr proposals, uh, I mean, possible proposals from uh, institutions like uh, LAH, uh, because there was a question about uh, whether the biomedical is part of a um, um, uh, part of this call. Uh, I, I think we explained uh, in, in the in the uh, last webinar. So we give more focus to the areas which are not uh, biomedical. But again, uh, we are not restricting any ideas here. If you have a strong case and uh, you want that this particular project must be addressed with the help of HPC. Uh, we cannot, we are also addressing uh, case by case. So uh, the summary is uh, from public inter research institutions point of view, if you have a, a good idea and which needs to be addressed with the help of HPC, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, open to listen to your uh, uh, queries. So that's all from my side for this today. And if you have any specific questions on uh, eligibility criteria or financials uh, after this uh, presentation, I'm, I'm happy to help you in this Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Max. Thank you very much, Saktival. So um, I guess we talked a lot about the main eligibility criteria for the companies, now also for the research organizations. Last but not least, I would also like to briefly give you an overview of the eligible project costs for the companies during this HPC call. During phase one of the call, you will be asked to provide a budget estimation of your eligible project costs. Of course, it's possible to refine this budget if you, if you and your project are retained for phase two. However, it will really be important to provide a realistic estimation, especially in light of the co-financing co or co-funding capacity that I discussed previously. As you can see on the left side of the slide, the main cost categories directly related to this HPC project would be the internal stuff costs of the company, the investments and equipment that shall be depreciated over the project duration, the materials and consumables, external subcontracting, as well as the additional overheads of the project. However, it's important to also mention here that not all of the company's costs are eligible for such state aid funding. Typically, costs related to more operational, marketing, or even administrative activities would not be directly eligible within such an R&D project. So with all this information on the criteria and the project costs, I would like to also give you a short reminder here on the upcoming Q&A sessions for the HPC call. The next webinar will thus be on the 13th of October to discuss the company's co-funding capacity in more detail. And the third and last Q&A session will be on the 7th of November, so roughly a week before the final submission deadline of phase one. And here we will give you the, uh, the possibility to do a completeness check and to uh, also ask your final questions before the submission. I would now like to also take the opportunity to remind you that you can already start preparing your application together with all your partners directly on the research industry collaboration platform. And if you encounter any technical issues on the platform or have any other questions regarding the project itself, the setup of your consortium, you can of course also send us a question directly via the contact form on the platform. With that being said, I would suggest that we now move on to the most interesting part of today's webinar, which should be the Q&A session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Great. 
Uh, so I'll reduce the size of the slides so we can see each other better. And I see there is a question already in the question stuff uh, saying the following. Uh, so we have a use case in healthcare with one of our partners. Is healthcare industry eligible for the joint call HPC? Who would like to take that? Yeah, maybe I can <clears throat> say a few words to this. So also hello from my side. Um, I think uh, Sakdivel mentioned that already uh, before, and uh, he was, was quite precise that also if this is not uh, directly part of the thematic areas uh, within the call text, um, if the project is more based on, for instance, developing some, some uh, computational uh, techniques uh, or, or things like this, then of course it, it, it will also can also be part of of this call. So um, as, as Saktival mentioned it already, uh, we will have a look at it case by case. And uh, so in principle, it's, it, it's not ex excluded. Yeah, maybe keep in mind there is also joint call for health tech uh, that it's upcoming that could be also a good opportunity in case you decide this is maybe not the best uh, for you. Uh, there is also the joint health tech. Um, right, Max? Uh, is it ongoing or is upcoming, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. that's correct. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, January, okay. if I'm right. Uh, second call. Uh, the next year call will start, if I'm right, Max. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. I'll go to the next one <clears throat> about the eligible costs for companies. Does do they cover the access cost for HPC for the company? Does they cover the license for commercial software usage on HPC? Um, um, yeah, yes, I can also take that, that question. So um, yeah, uh, of course, HPC costs um, are eligible, uh, access costs are eligible um, under, um, yeah, normally under instrumentation. Um, and uh, yeah, it also covers the, the license for commercial um, software. Good, thank you. Another one, uh, another question here. Could you share the link to the reference documents and video for the eligibility criteria? Yes, of course. Uh, you should receive an email after this webinar uh, with um, the information regarding both uh, documents or the presentation uh, we shared with you today and uh, the video replay. But again, this will be also available on the uh, research industry platform. Um, uh, you, you could find them there. Next question. Uh, we are a Luxembourg based company. Can we apply for this call, call to cover a joint research project with an international research institute? Who wants to take that? Uh, maybe I can take it up. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so maybe Christian can complement. See, the, the primary focus of this joint call is to enable or enhance the ecosystem in Luxembourg. So if the public, uh, clearly from the public institution's point of view, the, the public research organization must be present in Luxembourg. Uh, but I think one of the questions uh, Christian last time mentioned, uh, uh, again, this will go case by case, why we need an international partner here uh, when it comes on the com company side. But clearly from the public side, uh, it must be in Luxembourg. Yeah, okay. uh, maybe I can compliment uh, because we had that question also um, already. So also from the company side, um, of course, self-funded companies from abroad um, can also participate, but there must be at least one national uh, company also uh, within the, the consortia. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question. I could not grasp exactly the definition of the linked enterprises, e.g. controlling for the headcount. Can I find it defined in the website resources? Yeah, yeah. maybe I can uh, also give a brief recapitulation, recapitulation of uh, the linked companies. But of course, you can find also the definition directly in the presentation slides 
or the link towards the official definition in the uh, Euro European regulation. So with regards to the uh, linked enterprises, those would be companies that really control the majority of the voting rights, for instance, in a company. So if a company owns more than 51%, for instance, they would be considered linked. And these linked companies would also need to be included into the uh, SME analysis, first of all, to determine the size of the company and the group, but also with regards to the undertaking difficulty criteria, we would need to consider the, uh, the figures, so the FTEs, the balance sheet, and also the turnover for all the linked companies. Great, thank you. Um, then another question, what is expected, what is the expected size of project outline for phase one in terms of number of pages, number of words per section? Maybe I can take that one as well. So it's really the whole phase one will take place directly online on the research industry collaboration platform. It, um, you will see that there you have a couple of questions with also word limitation. We expect the project outline to be a rather short document. In the end, it should be a couple of pages um, if exported to PDF. But please be reminded that all the uh, project outline and all the attachments need to be uploaded directly on the platform. Good, thank you. And then I see there is another question popping up. How do you manage the IP and confidential issues from the company? Yeah, Christian. maybe I, I can take that question. So yeah, of course you should manage the IP by yourself. Um, so that is it, as it is in a joint call uh, for projects, you should um, uh, make an agreement with, with uh, the partner um, from, um, yeah, from the public uh, institute and, and, and see uh, who will earn uh, what kind of IP. So that's um, what you what you have to do. But this is some general general thing that that is uh, needed for for Avana projects, but also for for collaborative uh, Miko uh, projects concerning confidential issue. Um, yeah, in principle, um, we make sure that um, and that's also the case in phase two that um, some financial uh, statements that only concern the company are sent directly by the company to the MyGishe platform. So there will be no um, interference between these confidential information and, uh, and the partner uh, in the consortia. So that's how we uh, make sure that, that confidential um, uh, issues stay, stay confidential. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other question popping up. Is there uh, anything else here? Uh, yes, Sakti, would yeah, you like? Yeah. To? Maybe the, the word count, the, the characters count, uh, mm -hmm. the previous question, maybe I could address a little bit. I think in this phase two, uh, on uh, the application form, uh, there will be a character count, actually. So the project description will follow as it is in the FNR Bridges program description. Mm -hmm. So this means we'll have uh, character counts. Uh, so if in case this is a question from uh, is what uh, to, to be uh, to, 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 to know. So there is a character count. And again, coming back uh, to the, the latest question, since we don't have a questions, maybe I can also add a little bit on the, the IP and confidentiality agreement. Also for the phase two from FNR side, what we expect is this agreement is in place before the project starts, even pro before the uh, application comes to uh, FNR grant management system. We would expect this agreement between the public pa public entity and the private partner. Uh, this agreement exists. The, uh, so, I mean, uh, what is the uh, the, uh, the IP uh, status between uh, these two uh, or many partners? So, how it looks like, and uh, the agreement is in place before the submission. And because that is important, also the commercialization agreement. If they plan to go for the commercialization strategy in the future and what kind of, uh, you know, uh, how it looks like, how much revenues will be generated and what will be the share between the, the partners and, and so on. Great, thank you for complimenting this um, answer. 
Okay, I'm checking if there is any other question popping up, but I don't see any. Anyone else would like to say any other conclusion, concluding words, maybe while waiting to see if anyone else would like to ask a question. Otherwise, I think we can conclude here and invite everyone else uh, that have questions to um, don't hesitate to contact us uh, or um, through directly through the platform, um, the research industry platform. Um, yeah. Ah, yes, there's a question again. Will this recording be available to us? Yes, indeed. The platform is the place where to find every uh, thing related to the joint call HPC. Uh, so the call of the text, the text of the call, um, the webinars and replays, uh, replay of the webinars, and also the slides, um, and uh, where you will find the links and everything we shared with you uh, today. And uh, past sessions, next sessions uh, we'll have. So I will invite you to register to uh, the next Q&A we have on the 13th of October um, about co-funding capacity for uh, projects uh, in this joint call. Um, and um, the 7th of November, uh, the third Q&A session to um, discuss about completeness check before the submission for the first phase of the joint call. Uh, another question I see popping up, um, mentioning that the recording of the first session uh, is not easy to find on our platform. Uh, so I'll share the link. And scrolling down um, in the page of uh, that I share with you here, you will see um, the replays. Uh, so if you scroll down on research industry collaboration dot lu, uh, you scroll down on the page, you will find uh, all the sessions regarding the high performance computing call, uh, the first session, second sessions, and the following sessions uh, where you can register. Uh, and where you'll find the, uh, the replays and the slides. I hope it is clear uh, and you can find the recordings. Um, otherwise, don't hesitate to uh, type or um, to, question, to ask questions, to send us emails um, and ask for the, for the, the, the registration and the recording. Um, okay, I would uh, conclude here, if you agree. Ah, no, we have another one. <laughs> um, so another question popping up. Uh, we already make use of HPC for other projects. Are we still eligible if we propose a completely disjoint project? Would like to take that. Um, I can take this. One, uh, yeah, in principle, so we are focusing on, on, on companies that have uh, not much or, yeah, or no um, expertise in HPC. But uh, I think here, if, if um, yeah, it is a, a different target, um, there maybe new um, a, a knowledge that, that, that needs to be uh, learned. So then, then, of course, this, this would be also eligible. So, yeah, no question about this. Yeah, also because. I don't know if maybe I can complement this uh, the, the answer. As every um, HPC infrastructure is a bit little bit different uh, and has its particularities, and um, you need to adapt codes to that infrastructure. Um, you, in any case, may need to learn a bit in any case to adapt to this new infrastructure that you are using or to uh, yeah to get help from the research organization that could help uh, induce new projects uh, on a new HPC infrastructure that you've never used before. Okay, I hope the answer is exhaustive. Uh, answered your, your question exhaustively. 
Any other question? No. Um, any other information we could share with our attendees today? No. Okay. Okay. I see that we have covered everything we had here. Time to conclude, I guess. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you, uh, the speakers we had here today to present us uh, the eligibility criteria and the eligible project costs and answering to the question of our attendees. Um, and uh, we hope to see you for the next webinar uh, on 13 of October. Thank you and uh, um, hope to see you for the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.